Now, you don't have to turn to Nehemiah <laughs> because I'm using that one verse out of Nehemiah to teach out of Judges. And the verse out of Nehemiah, I'll read it to you. You turn to Judges. Nehemiah, that verse I was lifting out, that is, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. And why I stopped there was the peculiarity of the word saviors. We automatically, our mind goes immediately to, of course, there's only one Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. But this word was being used for people who were raised up by God. If you remember last week, I taught a message out of Judges and used the launching pad of both Judges 2.16 and Judges 2.18. Don't go there. How the Lord raised up Judges, which delivered saved the people out of the hands of those that spoiled them. And Judges 2.18, which is the key to the whole thing, the Lord raised up judges, and the Lord was with those that he raised up. Now, during the week, <clears throat> I did a festival which uh, tried to show you that one of the people named in, in the book of Judges, which is Abimelech, is not, uh, he is not a judge, even though he's in the book of Judges. He appointed himself. You can read that at your own convenience. I intend to actually try and teach a little bit on festival. The festival, for those who are listening who don't have a clue of what that is, is not this set behind me, but when I'm seated in the chair looking at you with the Bible open, usually spending time on one word or one comma or something. <clears throat> for those who love the Word of God, uh, but I will probably teach out of some part of Judges, so I, I don't want to spend all of the Sundays because I look at how many Sundays we've been in Nehemiah, and now I'm in Judges, but we've, this is message 21 for Nehemiah. Um, and I haven't even engaged in any heavy translation or anything, so uh, maybe praise God for that, I'm not sure. But So with that being said, I may or may not continue next Sunday. I may just try to kind of get you to watch on festival so I can continue the, the concept and move on in Nehemiah. Otherwise, we'll be here forever. Um, but last week, we looked at a few of the judges. Um, Othniel, Ehud, Shagmar, if you remember, Othniel, force of God, who was of the tribe of Judah. Ehud, the left-handed southpaw, Shamgar, who uh, killed a bunch of people with an ox goat. <laughs> mighty warrior, farm man, the agricultural killer, that's his name. <laughs> um, there are other people listed in the book of Judges, of course, and I deliberately am not going to do this this week. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to teach on Deborah or Gideon or Samson. These are very well known to most people. And the only comment I'm going to make right here, and I'll make it briefly, um, if you are a person who reads commentaries, if you like to read what other people said or wrote at some earlier time, this is the tragedy that I, I'm just going to say it. Um, it's a tragedy with some of the best commentators seem to have missed the essence of the whole book of Judges, um, which is God's sovereignty, God raising up people who look very much like us, some of them are very bizarre. Others are just very, their names appear in one or two lines, and then they disappear off the pages of history. But one of the things that I was kind of marveling at is the treatment of Deborah. And although I don't want to camp out on that because it seems like that could be a whole message for another time, it dawned on me that the bulk, I would go so far as to say 90% of the commentators grapple with what to do with Deborah because she's included in the judges, but you know, according to some, especially, we love the Baptists, I'm associated with some high-ranking Baptists, but it's mostly I see this with the Baptists, the, the mindset that women can't or shouldn't. Therefore, they deny the sovereignty of God in God's own book by saying, well, she couldn't have been this. When in fact, I'm just, this is just a footnote. As I study her life, I recognize she was a warrior. She wasn't just a judge, she was a warrior. 
She was a prophetess. She was somebody's wife. These are all important tidbits put in there. A mother in Israel, there's much to say about her, and unfortunately she, she didn't even get her fair treatment in the book of Hebrews, because if you read Hebrews 11, it said, and time would fail me if I could tell you of Gideon and Jephthah and Barak. There's no Deborah. So, yeah, anyway, amongst other things, we ladies, we will, we will talk with Eve when we get there. We'll, we will converse. But with that being said, um, her chapters are worth spending time on, but I don't want to do them today. Equally, all of these people have something in common, and that's that God raised them up. And to, to fail to recognize not everybody was warring. There are two judges, in fact, they're called minor judges, in, beginning in the 10th chapter, and if you'd like to turn there in the 10th chapter of Judges, one whose name is Tola and the other one who is Jair, and they combine make up 45 years of judging. And we know very little about their period that they judged in, except for the fact we can know that they, they produced a lot of children, they were prosperous, um, really maybe a little bit of prestige and maybe there was peace because there's not a whole lot of talk about how or what wars were waged. And just take a footnote there for a minute. I mentioned these two people and put them in the same camp with Shamgar who are relatively unknown. They appear and they disappear just as quickly. But just because pages and verses are not given to them doesn't take away from the fact that God raised these up for whatever purpose for a time. And this is probably the key thing that I, I wrestle with constantly meeting people who feel the need to appoint themselves or feel the need to tell me about what leadership is. And the reality is there are many people who are relatively obscure and have remained obscure in the pages of Scripture, and they did mighty things. I think about Adino. That's one of David's mighty men. Um, I think he killed... 800 Philistines with just a spear. There's many of these people, and we'll never really, you'll never hear a full message devoted to those people, but they're all part of what I'd call these obscure characters that God chose for that particular time to use. And so the message last week was to show you here are some very interesting folks. They're probably not the folks that we would choose if we were choosing a leader. And I mentioned Tola and Jair because they're just, they're just there. They're just mentioned. And by the way, the oddity is they judge for much longer periods and much less is said about them than the person who I'm going to talk about today, and that is Jephthah. And one of the things that is a pattern, we've seen this before in Judges, which the book of Nehemiah is talking about in the ninth chapter, this reoccurring, it is a cyclical event where we see the children of God sin. It brings up God's anger. And then when they cry out to the Lord, God raises up a deliverer. He delivers them, and then that deliverer dies, or she dies. And then a whole new cycle starts all over again. This is what we're reading in Nehemiah 9, and this is what I'm trying to bring to life to show you that these people being referred to in Nehemiah 9.27 as God raising up saviors, who saved them were people with great flaws, great frailty. They were not people that passed in front of a board of inspection to say, yep, I like that one there. That had a good strong, you know, good stock there. But they all have something innately very human about them. And this is why I said to you, if you really want to look at God's way of doing things, stick with the book because I'll show you just in a few verses how we are so capable of doing exactly what these people, the children of Israel, did for so many years, which is finding something to substitute. And by the way, that still goes on today. So I, we, I'm taking you into Judges. We're in the 10th chapter. And we're going to start at the 6th verse because this begins a new cycle. After Jair died and was buried in Camon, that's verse 5, 
Kemon, if you're interested, is just a few miles away from Lodabar. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Now, follow this here. Served Balaam, Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served not him. Now, don't you think it's interesting that the children of Israel had the capacity to find and worship every other god except the God? Now, that's not my message, but I just want you to... Sometimes we read this and we don't know how can this apply to us even in the now. Just that one verse tells me this is exactly how we are today. We're able to find a myriad number of things, even though Christianity, we'll, we'll say Judaism and Christianity, that have been the, the staple, the pivot around the ages, if you will, people can find everything else to worship and call everything else worshipful or label it as Christianity when indeed it's not. And the, the need of just solid Bible teaching, which is why I do what I do, this particular lesson may seem a little bit, uh, we'll call it simple in its form, but it's chock full of what goes on today, not antiquated, not old timey, but what goes on today, and we need to take a second look. So as I said, they're expert at finding every other God to worship except for the Lord. They, were, they knew how to forsake him and did it like no other. And here begins the cycle. The anger, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And each time this cycle begins, God sells the people. He, he raises up their enemies and basically puts the enemies to oppress the people. And that brings a new cycle of them crying out. So here, he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And let me stop right there. Because we who read the Bible, who are in the Bible, in the Word, we know the Philistines, if you go way back into the Table of Nations, Genesis 10, 14, tells you where the Philistines, out of which line that came from. That is out of the line of Mizraim. And if you follow Philist the word Philistine, the name Philistine, as it gets Grecianized, it will become what is known today as the word we use for Palestine. But don't confuse the two things. That's what a lot of people do. They confuse these. And the children of Ammon. And you've got to go back into Genesis 19. And the children of Ammon were, if you remember Lot, that separated from Abraham and took the better place. And he went to Sodom and Gomorrah. And his wife was turned to a pillar of salt. And I bet some of you husbands are going, how do I do that? How do I do that? <laughs> right? But it ends up that the daughters of Lot have incestuous relations with him that produce the children. The eldest daughter produces the line of Moab, which becomes the Moabites, which becomes that long line, which is very, for the most part, hostile to the people of God. And the only exclusion we might say is later on, where we meet the Moabitess Ruth, who becomes part of the genealogy to Christ. And the other daughter has a child named Ben Ami. And in Genesis 19, at the end of that chapter, it says, and these were the children of Ammon. So you can kind of get the idea of where these come from. So put it in the back of your filed card here. We often talk about the children of Ammon, and we think, these are from some far-flung, these are actually some distant relatives of the children of Israel by virtue of Lot. If you think about the genealogies, this is some part of the woodpile over there, all right? So uh, just saying so you can kind of put a, a compass on this of who we're dealing with. God turns them over to the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. It says, and that year... They vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, eighteen years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Now, it would be really helpful if you don't know Bible geography to just kind of make a mental note in your mind. If you were looking at a, a map, the best way to get your bearings for what they're talking about is think of a line that is um, up and down, we'll call that the Jordan, and 
to the east side of Jordan. You've got Gad, the, at the far-flung areas, you've got Heshbon, and you've got those, if you go to the south lightly, you've got um, Reuben, and to the north, you've got half the tribe of Manasseh, and to the other side, you're looking at the cities of Jericho and whatnot. So get your, get your footings of where Gilead might be. And Gilead is also going to be referred to as the name of Jephthah's father. So not to confuse the place and the person. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So here's your pattern again, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, and from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Minoanites, and that some translations may read Midianites, did oppress you, and you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. And there's our word for deliver. God saying he delivered them. Our same word in Nehemiah 9.27 as Savior. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. In other words, don't you remember all the things that I've done for you past and for your parentage, what came before you? God starts with the Egyptians and goes forward. Now, let me give these little footnotes as I go. It's so easy for us to forget because we're kind of fat, a fat cat society. It's so easy for us to forget all the things the Lord has done for us. Now, you know, children are taught to sing the song, count your blessings, name them one by one. But we do well to take a page out of just even these simple lessons where God says, you you've forsaken me to go and serve other gods. And if you remember how I started off, they didn't have a problem finding all the strangest gods that you could gather together to worship them. They just had a problem finding God until their, their parts were in a slinger. And then, right? And then. It's kind of tragic. But that's the way this cycle wor works. Now, this is kind of scary. God is talking. And he says, go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of tribulation. Do you think that's archaic, folks? Do you think that's, that, that's not applicable to us today? Because I meet a whole lot of people that will make their god. I, I told you the story about a fellow I once knew who bicycling was his god. And everything about the bicycle and the sport of bicycling and the, the, the uniform and, you know, the hat, everything, the whole life including, by the way, what was more important was a bike race on Sunday morning than church and listening to Bible teaching. And it's very easy to say, it's what C.S. Lewis said about where is there any harm about curling up with a good book, but if it takes you away from the good book, if anything comes between you and God, it becomes an idol, which is what John talks about in 1 John when he closes his book by saying, children, guard yourself, be aware, guard yourselves from idols. And we tend to think idols as in Baal and Ashtoreth, but we don't recognize that there's all kinds all around us. So, go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen, let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And isn't that uh, so typical? We, we cry and call out to God when we are in the worst situations. Um, a diagnosis of a disease. I'm not saying it's wrong to cry. Anything that makes you cry out to God is great. But why do we have to wait until it's a crisis? I guess we are just like these children. God's scary. He says, go and cry to the ones you made. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Now the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. Mizpah, the place of the watch or the watchtower. 
And the people and the princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all, over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now this, is, this leads us to Jephthah. And what's so strange is Jephthah's passage, it doesn't say, and God raised up Jephthah. And there's good reason for this. And this, this is why I'm so attracted to talk to you about this that God saw fit to include in his book because it exists in real life. It exists all around us. Here is Jephthah. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor. I want you to notice the order of things. Jephthah, the Gileadite, first he is called a mighty man of valor. Secondly, he was the son of a harlot. See, I have trouble with people who don't want to teach out of the Bible in these passages because they're embarrassed or they're ashamed. I'm not. I'm so grateful that God included these people. And, and this one is one of the ones he raised up, even though it doesn't say, and God raised up Jephthah. The beginning, Judges 2.18, tells me, and God raised up Jephthah, without the words being printed there. This mighty man of valor, before he was even considered to be that, we have this memorial that he was the son of a harlot. His birth is recorded here just like that, son of a harlot. And there are many other people in the Bible, when we think of the word harlot, automatically Rahab comes up. And we think of, well, that's the one that God saved. But there's many other people that played the harlot. In fact, Israel in Hosea 4.15 is referred to as a harlot because she chased after other gods. So it's important to understand when, when this word appears, even though it's shocking for the English uh, listener and reader to read, God used this language to send, to drive home a message to say, I do not choose just a simple elite group over here, nor do I choose only this group, but I choose from all these people. And these that I use, these are those this mighty man of valor who was a son of a harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. We have his birth, the beginnings, if you will, and his bravery are listed here. Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. So pretty clear that Gilead... Uh, found some, some, something else over there, right? And uh, took interest in it and produced Jephthah. So what's interesting about this is, I want you to see this. Jephthah's name is Jehovah will open. That's what his name means. And it's interesting that God opens up the vista of this man's life for us to look and see this very not... Uh, noteworthy beginning, which is why I said the beauty of the Bible is you can go into the New Testament and read what Paul says, how God has chosen the base things to confound the wise, because none of us here would say, we'd pick him. In fact, his brothers thrust him out, kicked him out, rejected of his own brethren. And how many times have I told you, you know, the terrible thing is we read and sometimes we make this into a caricature. But Jesus came, and he came to his own, and his own received him not. It's always the same thing. It's very difficult for people to really grab the message that maybe God's greatest rejects are his most important people. They're the ones he cares about. So if you're sitting here listening to me and you feel like you're one of those, first of all, join the club, and secondarily, know that God loves you enough because he called you out of a group of people who might think they are the chosen elite like the man I sat across from one night at dinner, and he said, well, I've never sinned, Sister Scott, I've never sinned. <laughs> no, I'm so glad I know the Bible. The Bible, again, out of First John, says if any man says that they haven't sinned, they're a liar. Well, okay, you just did, but we'll leave you in your delusions. Jephthah fled from his brethren, dwelt in the land of Tov, that is good, if you want what that means. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. Vain meaning worthless or without a cause. 
And that's sometimes what happens. When you get thrust out of one group or a clique you thought you were part of, you tend to join yourself to other people in the same uh, realm as you might perceive yourself as. And it says, it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. Isn't that interesting? They said unto him, Jephthah, come be our captain that we may fight against the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders, did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? Wait a minute. Why are you coming to get me? You guys kicked me out. And why are you coming to me now when you're in distress? Jephthah is like a microcosm of what I just described about God and the people of God always crying out when there's a trouble here on the horizon. They're in distress. As I said to you, even though nowhere does it say, and God raised up Jephthah, the fact that they went to him tells you that God raised up Jephthah. Jephthah didn't say, well, well I'll go, even though he says that. God raised this man up. The elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? Will I be your leader then? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us if we do not so according to thy words. Now, this is interesting because you, you don't really tend to look at this this way, but I hope you'll see what I'm seeing. It's, it's, it's a very profound statement. Now, whether Jephthah was born of a believing mother or not, just as she was a harlot, most people in commentaries will say that Jephthah could not have been a believer. But the reality is you begin to listen to what Jephthah says and you realize that not only was Jephthah a believer and knew who the Lord was, he knew the history of God's people, and I think the two go hand in hand. If you know the history of the church, and if you know the history of where you've been, you might really know who you're dealing with, because you know that God delivered, and therefore he'll deliver us now. This is the mindset that has to go with the concept of Jephthah. Jephthah went out with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Now Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me, and why art thou come against me to fight in my land? Now this is what the king answers back to Jephthah. Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt, from Arnon even unto Jabbok and unto Jordan. Now therefore restore those lands again peaceably. Jephthah sent messengers again unto the king of the children of Ammon and said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab nor the land of the children of Ammon. Here's where you get clarity about who Jephthah is. He's a man who knows the history of his people. He didn't have to go and consult. He's going to set this heathen king straight, he says, well, part heathen king at least. He's going to set the record straight. He says, when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea, and came unto Kadesh. Then Israel sent out messengers unto the king of Edom. We covered that territory a few weeks ago, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. In like manner they sent to the king of Moab, and he would not consent. Israel abode in Kadesh. Now you, this will be familiar, because I just taught on this in the last couple of weeks. They went along through the wilderness, compassed the land of Edom, the land of Moab came by the east side of the land of Moab, pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites. You remember him? Taught out of Nehemiah that message a few weeks ago. That's that land we're discussing now. Jephthah's saying, you need to get your facts straight. And Jephthah didn't say, and... Moses and Joshua, he's going to say very clearly, the Lord did this thing. So you can not only read that Jephthah is a man who knows history, but he's a man who knows who God is, who his God is. He says, Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land, 
into my place, but Sion trusted not Israel to pass through his coast. But Sion gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz, fought against Israel. Verse 21, and the Lord God of Israel delivered Sion and all of his people into the hand of Israel. They smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. They possessed all the coast of the Amorites, from Arnon, even unto Jabbok, from the wilderness unto Jordan. So now, the Lord God of Israel, important speech coming out of Jephthah's mouth. I'm not even going to tell you that I know the history of my people, but I know the history of my God as a deliverer. And I know the history of my God and my people. Get your facts straight, is essentially, if we're going to put a little spin on this. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? Because God did this thing, and now you're thinking that you, this land should be yours when God basically got the victory. We claim the land. Why should you say that it's yours? And he goes on and adds to this, Will not thou possess that which Shemesh thy God giveth thee to possess? In other words, if your God is so great, take what he gives you, because he hasn't given you this land which our God has given us. So it's kind of like, put that in your pipe and smoke it, right? <laughs> now, here's, what's, here's what I love about this. Because if, you, you know, if you're really reading this, that's why I said be careful. If you read things that commentators write, sometimes they write things and it's, it, it, it doesn't even correspond to the person being presented here. So, what part of that, verse 24 he says, so whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them we will possess. Here's the man of faith. I just told you about the man of history. Here's the man of faith saying, whatever God does, he does it well. So if you're reading commentaries and they say Jephthah wasn't a believer or he didn't know, I'm just telling you, read those verses again. You know this is a man who knew the history of God's people and of God's deliverances, and he was a man of faith. And now... Art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor? Here's another one of these. You've got to go back into Numbers if you wanted to read about him, king of Moab. Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns, and in Ero and her towns, and in all the cities that be along the coast of Arnon, 300 years. In other words, why did you wait this amount of time? You waited 300 years to now make this an issue? Are you new? <laughs> Don't you love the way Dr. Scott said that when he said, are you new? Because he added, a, he added an adjective of color, which could be used as a verb or a noun. <laughs> oh, boy. That makes my cheeks hurt when I think about that. Is, we wait 300 years for this? Jephthah says, wherefore, I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. And this is Jephthah's faith. He says, the Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. That's why I said, forget about what these commentators say about whether or not it tells you right here. He says, God's going to decide. God knows what's going on. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearken not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. And isn't that always like that? You'll always get people who will come and they'll tell you, this is the way it is, and this is the way it's going to be. But they don't have a clue like Jephthah. He knew the history. He had faith. He knew who his God was. And here's where you get to realize that not only did God raise up Jephthah, but just like Gideon and just like Samson, verse 29, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead, Gilead means a rough place, uh, passed over Manasseh. You remember that when in the teaching way back there that is causing to forget, and passed over Miz Mizpah, the place of the watchtower. He passed over all these places unto the children of Ammon. If you want to put some pictorial sense on this, once the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he passed through the rough places, he passed through the place of what we will call causing to forget, a man who understood what his mission was about and went past the place of the watchtower or the place of watch, straight to the place where the Lord was sending him on a mission. Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, 
and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now, some of you who know this story really, really well, some people have said, we know when he comes home, it's his daughter that comes through the door. And it's been a big place of contention for people of all ages, I'm talking about through the ages, to uh, come to some grips about what's actually being said here. But you don't have to reach too far if you recognize what he's doing. He's making a vow. And if, it, if this thing was displeasing to God, God would have not given him the victory. I and mean, people don't stop to think about this in a very analytical way. God could have said, seeing you've made this rash, unrealistic vow, I will not deliver the children of Ammon this day to you. But rather, he makes, Jephthah makes a vow, and he says, Lord, if you'll do this thing. You know how I translate that? I translate that exactly the way the New Testament talks about if you will not prefer in other words, if, if you cannot prefer Jesus above your mother, sister, father, brother, yea, and your own life also, you cannot be his disciple. Here's a man who cares more about getting the victory for God's people. And believe me, if you read very carefully, this is Jephthah's vow, whatever comes through my door. He didn't say randomly the servant's door. He said my door, and it goes without saying this is his only child. So he could have either been making a vow and saying, either my wife, which is not mentioned here, but either my wife or my daughter, or maybe a goat. <laughs> pick, it's like the Siamese cat, pick one. But I mean, he didn't make this vow without knowing that it's a very limited pool of people that are going to come through his door, is what I'm trying to say. And many people have said, well, this is a rash statement, but it's not rash. He opened his mouth and as we'll see, he says, I've opened my mouth, I cannot go back. Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hand. And this is the key thing here. Just like every other person who the battles are recorded for us, it's saying this is what God did when he raised up this person to deliver the people if you remember the story of Gideon, Gideon was so fearful, and what if, and how much, and let me put a fleece, and all of these unique people. It's like God saying, I have one spirit, and it is the spirit of truth, but that one spirit will inhabit people that are diverse, and Jephthah is a prime example of this diversity. They basically wipe out a great slaughter, verse 33, um, describing the, er the territory of where this battle against the children of Ammon took place and were subdued there, it's quite a vast territory. Jephthah then came after the, the victory. Je Jephthah came to Mitzpah and to his house. And behold, his daughter came to meet him with timbrels and dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. Now, why is this detail important? Even though I'm taking a sidebar to tell you about this uh, passage which says he vowed to whatever comes through my door I will offer as a sacrifice unto the Lord. And people automatically think that um, Jephthah must have sacrificed as in slaughtered his daughter. But in fact, that's not a, a right or accurate reading. And a better reading to understand is that she will, the daughter says, Father, only that you let me go out for two months and uh, lament with the other maidens, if you will, because it stresses clearly that she was a virgin, that she would never marry. So it's very clear from a few verses that what his vow meant is much like what Hannah would do when she presented her child before the Lord and dedicated the child to the Lord and became the Lord's. That meant that in Jephthah's daughter's case, she would never marry. She would be dedicated wholly unto the Lord, not burnt with fire or some other thing as the pagans did to their children. So... That passage shouldn't be, some people avoid this because they say, well, you know, he made a rash vow. No, what he did was he said, I want the victory for God's people, 
and for God above everything else in my life, no matter what that is. You know what? It's unfortunate that more people don't read this passage and take from it that this is the same type of mindset that should permeate the church, caring more like the prophet Elijah about God's word and the things of God, and God takes care of those people, not the ones who are busy finding every other thing to do except that one thing that God said. And that one thing that God said today is for us to trust him, to have faith in his word, to, have, to look at these, all of these people and realize that there's something there for us to glean now, I'm skipping over the passage of Jephthah's daughter because I've explained it to you in a nutshell. He kept his vow. He said, I've opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot go back. And there's a delightful passage out of Ecclesiastes 5 that talks about making vows with the mouth. You know, better to not make a vow. That's more displeasing to make a vow and then to turn back than to make a vow. And if you've opened your mouth, you stay the course. You want the colloquial for that? You keep your word to your own hurt. And I remember being by Dr. Scott's side and him saying that many times about himself. He was a man of his word. If he said he would do something, if he said he was going to meet you somewhere, if he said whatever, he would do it even to his own hurt. And we're talking about that same quality in Jephthah and in any person who cares more about the things of God. Just remember one thing, when people start fussing about the now, I'm not telling you, don't worry, have no worries, but I am telling you that it's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 6 when he said, be not anxious. See all these things, the birds, the flowers, who, who toils for them, who does for them, but aren't you more important than these? The trust factor comes back into play, the Lord will take care. If God brought you up and called you out and has awoken in you that spirit that says, I'm his, I belong to him, then trust that he's going to see you through. Now, I'm going all the way to the 12th chapter, which is just actually a few verses away. Spirit of exaggeration has taken over me. <clears throat> because this closes the passage on Jephthah. Now, remember I said to you, the two judges that opened this that I talked about, Tola and Jair, they reigned a, co a combination together, combined, of 45 years. Jephthah only reigned six years, or judged six years, rather. And yet you've got so many more verses and details. And I like this 12th chapter for a specific purpose now to kind of bring the message to a close. The men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? How come you went out to fight the children of Ammon, and, and you didn't call us? You've got to know a little backstory. They did the same thing to Gideon. The Ephraimites came out, and they did virtually the same thing to Gideon. Gideon, believe it or not, kind of said, Back off, buddy, and they did. Here, not so much. And they say to Jephthah, we will burn down thine house with, upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. I was calling on you to help me, and you would not. And when I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my hands, passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore, then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? God did this thing. Hey, I called on you to come help me, and you didn't come. Now, I've been reading this passage, I think, the whole week. And every time I've looked down at this, I've seen the same thing over and over and over again. Don't think Jephthah and the people from Ephraim. Think of a man of God or a woman of God, a person raised up by God, and people who would like to have the lip service to say, well, you, you should have done this. Jephthah, Pastor Jephthah, you should have done this. You know, I don't, I don't really appreciate that you didn't come and consult me, you know, because yeah. I was reading this the whole time and thinking, this is what I have encountered for many years. People who, when you call and you put the call out and you say, come on, folks, 
come back into the church, start giving again, start acting in faith, start doing. And all they want to do is what these people do. Well, you didn't call us, you didn't ask us anything. Right, what's... Jephthah, you got some nerve. You went out there and you, you fought, you took, you usurped. You didn't, you, 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 right? <laughs> right? But listen to what Jephthah says. This is highlighted in my Bible. The Lord delivered them into my hand. God did this thing. Now, if Jephthah was another type of man, like an Absalom, he would have said, hey, we went out there and we just kicked you-know-what, and too bad, we did this thing. But Jephthah gives all the credit to the Lord, and he says, the Lord did this thing. Now, some people have criticized me many times, and they've said, well, why don't you take credit for something, or why don't you, because I say everything that happens in my life, to God be the glory. I know it's all of him, because on my own, I can do nothing. I know that for a fact. So the Lord delivered them into my hand. The Lord gets the credit, all the credit. Then Jephthah gathered together the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. You're a bunch of renegades. You're, what, what business? You didn't consult us. What business do you have? I, think, I want you to put flesh and blood on this because there'll always be people in the church just like this. You didn't ask me. You didn't consult me. Well, wait a minute. Where did Jephthah get his orders from? Some of you got that. The elders of Gilead might have come to, to ask him to be their head, but God raised up Jephthah for a purpose. And these people were too silly, too proud, You'll see Ephraim and other places, Samaria, sometimes associated with the northern tribes. And when you get into the books of Hosea and other parts of the Bible, it will talk about these people and their pride. And they were very, very prideful people. So then they're accusing them of being fugitives, uh, renegades. And the Gileadites took the passage of the Jordan before the Ephraimites. You see, they had to cross over the Jordan to get back into their territory. So this all becomes interesting here. So that those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over. That the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said no, then they said unto him, Okay, if, if it's really true what you're saying, say Shibboleth. Shibboleth. And he said Sibboleth because he could not, they couldn't pronounce it. It's like if you're listening to people who are Britishers, who have a tendency to put a W into the R. There's all kinds of accents, even through um, Texans or whatever. These people had that. They could not say shh, shh. And just true to two New Testament uh, verbiology here, truly thou, thy speech givest you away, right? Uh, they couldn't say that, for they then took them. They took him and slew him at the passage of, passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite. He was buried in one of those cities of Gilead. And why did I bring this to your attention? Because when it says, and God raised up saviors that saved them, I want you to think of this man. It doesn't say that he went to... Uh, the Gadite University. It doesn't say that he had any type of formal education. In fact, I love the fact that the second thing after mighty man of valor, son of a harlot. Too bad, too bad that most people don't understand. No, you don't have, not everybody in the church is a son of a harlot, by the way. And not every preacher in the pulpit or preacher, pastor, is a son of a harlot or a harlot themselves. But this is the type of thing that I look at and I think, Whoever was preaching in Nehemiah saying, and God raised up saviors, called the name of Jephthah, included in that line of people which are memorialized in the book of Hebrews as the heroes of faith, that this is the type of stuff God will work with. And all the credit through Jephth Jephthah's victories were all to the glory of God. Now the lesson for us today is a pretty simple one. That's why I said I'll probably end up taking you somewhere else next week because I could keep going on how God raised up saviors and these delivered and ultimately brings us to the Savior 
1 John 4.14, the Savior, Jesus Christ, of the world. One Savior, that's it, did it all, paid it all. But the most important thing I want to say for this message is that God used some very interesting people. They didn't all look like each other. That's why I said don't ever, ever remove the sovereignty of God from not only these people here, from people like Deborah and Gideon and Jephthah. Never remove the sovereignty of God in your life, that God has chosen you, as I said last week, raised you up, brought you into the realm of being aware that you are one of the called ones, which is a precious thing in his sight, that people can walk with eyes closed, not, not understanding. They've been called, they've been chosen. And maybe you are... Uh, and fit into the category of Jephthah, which is people will look and say, but you don't have, you're not a preacher's kid, or maybe you're a second generation Christian. I love the people that say, well, what about those people who've always been in the church? Well, David Duplessis said, God has no grandchildren. In other words, each person must come to the moment of understanding who they are and what they are to be born again from above. And when that deposit is placed in you and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, it is very much raising up the base thing. We were all of that base thing, children of darkness, brought into his glorious light. And this message tells me something, that if God will work with this type of stuff and it's memorialized for us, then when we look around this room and you think about people who God has brought out of darkness into the light, recognize that there are probably more Jephthahs and more Gideons and more Barracks and more of these types than there are of the people that would tell you that the church is a habitation of those pristine people, like the man I heard two days ago on television saying, well, some of those churches, they haven't put away sinning yet. <laughs> well, they can stay in their beautiful pharisaical towers of whatever it is that they're not really living in, but I live for messages like this to bring to our awareness. God raised up these base people for the wise, for the wisdom of the world, it makes no sense. But for us who understand we're being saved, it makes perfect sense. It's woven into the gospel of grace that says, this is exactly how God takes the broken, the frail, the downcast, the downtrodden, and lifts them up to place his nature and his life in them to become new creatures in Christ Jesus. He raised up saviors in the judge's day. He's given us the savior, Jesus Christ, for us in our day and for eternity. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. That's my message. Come on. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.